Hello ladies and gentlemen, I am the Omni Viewer, and I'm here with another author's take on video, this time to discuss something that hopefully doesn't get me demonetized. The use of mature content in popular fiction. I'm partly doing this because, as of this video's posting, the 2019 film reboot of Hellboy is fairly new, and also very unpopular if you look around. You can find all sorts of reviews and very, very, very few of them are, have anything positive to say. And among the complaints people have, which is a complaint I also expressed, is that its use of mature content was terrible. Absolutely terrible. It was yet another one of those movies that set out to try and be R-rated. That's actually a personal pet peeve of mine when it comes to any sort of fiction, movies or books or anything. Um, if it goes out of its way to be as mature as possible, if they say, like, up front, we are making this for adults so we're going to have all sorts of adult content in it that kids aren't going to be able to see, that's usually a red flag for me personally. That's usually something that has me on edge thinking, oh great, they're gonna do it wrong. And most of the time it seems like they do. However, lest you think I'm about to take the hard line and say that mature content shouldn't be in fiction at all, you're wrong. I actually am not against the idea. I just think that there needs to be a certain art to it. Here's the thing about the Hellboy reboot and any other movie of a similar nature to it. Its use of mature content is, somewhat ironically, immature. There's this odd mindset wherein stuff for adults is viewed as stuff that has to have stuff like excessive violence and excessive cursing and excessive sexuality without really having any reason for it most of the time. That's a common complaint you actually see amongst a lot of people who do these sort of in-depth analyses of media. With the Hellboy version, for example, I mean, it doesn't help the movie's case that we have two PG-13 Hellboy movies prior to it that got by just fine and were much better received without the excessive gore and excessive language. But even if you remove that, the way in which it uses that content does not actually feel like it's truly mature. Like, um, you know, in some episodes of The Simpsons, uh, I don't recall which one specifically, because it happens a couple times, where Bart Simpson tries to swear, but because he's a kid and doesn't really know how to swear, he just strings all the words he knows together without any rhyme or reason. Kind of like that. That's how that movie feels, and it's how a lot of movies that make excessive use of that language feels. And also, the gore can be done in the same way. See, thing is, every single creative type goes through a certain phase, usually in their teenage years, where they start trying to experiment with what they perceive as adult content. Because they don't want to make that kid stuff anymore, that's lame. They want to make adult stuff. And they know, or at least they think they know, what is in adult entertainment. Swearing and sex and gore and whatnot. Not necessarily all at once, it depends on the genre, but you have those elements in there. But they don't necessarily know how to use them properly, so they just sort of do it in excess. Sometimes because they want to shock their peers and their parents. Quite a few of the people who go through this phase grow out of it. Some of them don't. And you can usually tell the ones that don't because they continue to go for the shock value. They continue to throw that stuff in there as much as possible simply for the sake of being shocking. And the thing about being shocking is that shock can wear off. That's the thing. Uh, the first time you hear somebody drop an F-bomb, let's say, 
it's like, oh, my innocent child ears, that's a shock to you. But the more you hear people say it, especially if it's in a work of fiction where they're saying it every other sentence, eventually you're just like, eh, white noise. I barely even hear it anymore. And that's the thing. You try to be shocking, the shock isn't going to last. And the same can be said for like the first time you see an especially violent scene in a movie, or the first time you read something that's uh, kind of saucy, let's say, in a book, or, or any example. If, as a creative type, you always go for shock value, that proves you really don't know what you're working with. It might also prove that you don't really know how to do anything truly mature. I mean, I grew up watching a lot of old movies and reading a lot of old books and what have you, and those are all from a time when standards for what you could get away with in entertainment were much stricter. There was a time... Well, it, actually, the history of film is kind of weird because during that initial silent era where they were just figuring film out, you could actually get away with quite a bit. But then the Hayes office came along and said, no, you have to have a certain set of standards. We can't allow this stuff to be seen by such a widespread medium. And over the years, that's kind of peeled back a little bit more and more to the point where there's this running joke that the MPAA rating system doesn't really mean anything anymore because the stuff you can get away with in a movie that is supposedly safe for kids is crazy. Anyway, like I said, I grew up with that stuff. And as a result, I have... Well, I see it as sort of a media studies class unto itself, just watching movies or reading books. I have an understanding of how you can tell a story, a very mature story, mind you, without the excessive stuff. Because those movies I'm talking about, stuff like either Casablanca or the original Universal Monsters movies or classic Godzilla movies and stuff, they were from an age where you couldn't swear, or if you did swear, they had to be fairly mild ones. You couldn't show excessive amounts of blood, if you could show blood at all. Don't even think about showing any nudity. And they, as a result, I mean, like, people always like to say they don't like censorship because it restricts what you're able to say. But what they don't often tell you is that if you are working within a particular standard of you cannot show this, then you have to come up with a more creative way of showing it. Without necessarily showing it, maybe. You can make it clear what's going on without actually showing it blatantly, and sometimes it can actually have a much greater impact. So, there is something to be said for the idea that you don't always need mature content. Uh, I personally grew up with the philosophy that my parents instilled in me, which is, just for an, the sake of an example, Swearing is a technique used by people who don't really have anything intelligent to say. That's a broad generalization, mind you. I'm not casting judgment on people who do swear. But the way I take that and apply it to my writing is that I want to try and figure out a way to get the point across without that language. There are quite a few times where, like, I watch or read different works and there's just so much swearing in it I'm like they don't actually need those words in there they could have said the exact same thing with the exact same emotion and not needed any four-letter words uh, again the recent Hellboy reboot is a great example there are so many examples of characters swearing strongly in there when they don't really need to, and again, it feels like they're doing it just to be shocking, or just to get that R rating. So, I, I it can be seen as a challenge if you look at it in the right way, but again, I'm not taking the hard line and saying that mature content should be completely absent from fiction. What I'm saying is that 
you don't necessarily need it. But if you are going to use it, and here's the real crux of what I'm going to say, if you are going to use it, you need to use it well. Like I said, the philosophy I was instilled with is, swearing is a tactic used by people who don't have anything intelligent to say. Another way you can look at that is, swearing is what you say when there's nothing left to say. And you can attach that to another statement, another adage, if you will, which is, where conversation ends, conflict begins. So, I don't actually have much in the way of strong language in my currently published book, Operation Red Dragon. I'm currently working on another book that does contain some harsh language, but I'm always sure to use it strategically. If a character is going to use that kind of language, it's either against someone they really, really despise, or it's a punctuation mark that sets off an actual fight. I think that sort of thing is a good thing to have in mind. If you're going to use mature content, it's got to have impact. And it's not just with foul language. I know I've been bringing that up a lot, but let's say, uh, let's say it's violence. Now, with violent content in media, again, that's shocking when it's done a particular way, but how can you use it to the best effect for a truly mature story? I mean, you, you look at the slasher film genre. That's a genre that's built on depicting violence. And, well, we all know the problem that plagues most slasher movies. It becomes so much about showing all the strange and creative and gruesome ways to kill people that it just kind of loses its edge. It, you don't really care anymore. You're more going to see what they come up with than because you actually feel anything when it happens. But if you have a story where there is a particularly violent act and it really hits home with you, I mean, that's when you use violence in a good way. Like, um, say you're making a war movie. Uh, Saving Private Ryan, I think, would be a good example. I know I'm bringing up a lot of movies in this author's take on thing, but violence is kind of a visual thing, so I have to kind of reference movies for this one. Um, Saving Private Ryan is a good example of how to use really visceral graphic violence to good effect because war movies, and Saving Private Ryan is a war movie, and a true war movie, no less, war movies have a tendency to sanitize war. There are many, many war movies out there, especially from back when World War II was happening. They were making a lot of World War I and World War II movies before, during, and after that war. Um, that don't really depict especially bad graphic violence. And there's also something to be said that that has carried over into a bunch of other works, sometimes more fantastical ones. Violence is just sort of something that you... that, that you know, you don't see a lot of blood in those older movies. Characters, if they're shot, they just fall over which might be more realistic, sure, but it kind of makes you think, oh, well, war doesn't actually seem that horrible. So, if you look at Saving Private Ryan, and you see that opening scene with the storming of the beach at Normandy, and it's a bloodbath, and it's really disturbing to watch. Like, you have to be really desensitized to violence to not feel something when you're watching it. And that sort of drives home the point of this isn't some sanitized war movie. This isn't some purely gung-ho patriotic pro-war kind of movie. Not that I really think any movie these days would be pro-war. This is the reality. This is the horror of war. 
And that sort of thing is really effective. And from that point onward, the movie does tone it down. There are large stretches where the characters are just traveling and not really doing all that much. And then, of course, some sort of conflict can't happen again, and that's when the violence kicks up again, and that's when it really leaves an impact. If it was just non-stop bloodshed from start to finish, you eventually wouldn't care. But it was strategically used throughout. And it's a little tricky for me to broach the subject of how to do sexual content properly, so I'll just speak in vague terms about that. I gotta play it safe with the whole YouTube system, you know? And I will say that even then, it's really got to mean something. If you're going to have two characters hook up just for the sake of having a titillating scene, then again, you're not really doing it properly. It's got to really mean something. It's got to have that impact. I mean, that's the overall point I'm making, right? See, mature content needs to have with it maturity. And you can tell a mature story without that stuff, but if you're going to tell it with that stuff, you've got to handle it with the respect and tact that it deserves. I'm sure if you've been on the internet long enough, you may have noticed quite a few adult commentators speaking about that which we would call kids content. Uh, cartoons or Disney movies or what have you. There are a lot of adults who consider themselves fans of kids shows. Like, especially in recent days. From stuff like My Little Pony, to Star vs. the Forces of Evil, to the DuckTales reboot, to even older stuff that they grew up with and have revisited, like Animaniacs or Darkwing Duck or the like. And of course, all those classic Disney movies. Now, have you ever wondered why there are so many adults speaking about these quote-unquote kids' media and treating them as if they are mature works? I mean, the obvious answer most people like to give is because the people talking about them are themselves immature. But I don't necessarily think that's the case. I think the actual reason is because that kids' entertainment is providing them with that mature storytelling and mature character development that's often lacking in a lot of adult entertainment. I mean, you certainly have far more people speaking positively of My Little Pony than there are speaking positively of Family Guy these days. And why is that? Well, it's not necessarily because MLP is the most groundbreaking show ever, despite what a few have claimed. It's more because MLP is telling stories that actually treat your audience with a certain level of intelligence, it doesn't condescend, and it actually can tell a very, well, not necessarily too complex, but intricate enough kind of story to make you think, yeah, that's a good way to handle this subject. Whereas with something like Family Guy, there's a lot of that shock value stuff, like, ah, we're making offensive jokes, aren't you offended? But you're also laughing at these people we're offending, aren't you? And kind of talking down to certain groups that they don't agree with, and generally just not having much maturity to it. Here, let me jump back to the use of curse words for a moment to give you an example of how I think they can be used properly. My example comes from M.A.S.H., one of the greatest TV series of all time. I think we can all agree on that, right? Uh, the way I see it, there are only two kinds of people in the world. Those who love M.A.S.H. and liars. Now, if you watch M.A.S.H. with as much frequency as I have, and admittedly it's been a while, but I did used to watch M.A.S.H. quite a bit back in the day, you start to pick up on certain patterns when it comes to the characters. And one of those patterns is that our main man, Captain Benjamin Franklin Pierce, also called Hawkeye, he's no stranger to using foul language, but he normally only reserves it for the antagonist of the episode. He, which you might call the villain, or she sometimes. Uh, that's who he saves the really bad stuff for. He's... He's no stranger to just 
annoying people that he's not too fond of. But if you really get on his bad side, you know it because that's when he starts cursing at you. Now, there's this one episode. It's been a while, so I don't remember which season or what the title was. If any of you recognize it, put it down in the comments section. Where Radar gets wounded, brought into the OR, and Hawkeye chokes. He can't operate on him. He's a little too connected, if you will. So someone else has to take over. And while Radar's in post-op, he learns about this, and it kind of rocks his world a little because he's he, he looks up to Hawkeye, and he just can't seem to wrap his head around the fact that this doctor who can do just about anything under pressure wasn't able to do anything for him. And when he tries talking to Pierce about that, Pierce slowly becomes more and more uncomfortable knowing how Radar looks up to him, eventually storming out, but not before saying, and I quote, to hell with your hero worship and your teddy bear, and while we're at it, to hell with you. Now, I admit that's not very strong as far as curse words go, but like I said, Hawkeye only talks that way to people he really does not like. So, for that scene, he speaks that way to Radar. Innocent, lovable, wounded Radar. And he speaks that way because Radar looks up to him. Something's wrong. That's how you know something is really wrong. And when Hawkeye comes back to try apologizing, Radar turns it right back at him. And Radar never speaks that way, or if he tries, he backs down quickly. And it carries so much weight when those scenes happen. Even though it's fairly mild as far as foul language goes, it really hits you. You're like, you don't want to see Hawkeye and Radar opposed like that. And that is what I mean when I say that if you're going to use that kind of content, it's got to have impact. And that's just one example. Now, for my own part, I generally try to make my work as accessible as possible to everyone, young and old. Not because of some sort of censorship or prudishness, but more as a personal challenge. I want to convey that idea that you can tell these stories without having to resort to the graphic stuff. But, at the same time, if I encounter, over the course of writing a story, something where the only thing you can say is a curse word, or the only action can result in something violent, or what have you, and there's just no way, other way to do it that will have as much impact. Well, I do what is necessary for the story. That's the ultimate message, I think. It must be appropriate for the story. Even if it's inappropriate content, it must be appropriate for what you're trying to do with your work. That's maturity. That is how you use mature content in a mature way. At least that's where I stand on it. And, well, it seems to be working for me so far. It's just the advice I have. Until such time as we meet again, this is the Omni Viewer signing off. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like it, as well as subscribe to the channel for more content of a similar nature. Also, check the description for links to our Twitter, DeviantArt, and Patreon pages, as well as the Amazon link for the novel Operation Red Dragon The Daikaiju Wars Part 1, penned by yours truly. Thank you all, and we appreciate your support.